Welcome back to Breaking Monero. Today we are talking about Monero's ring input selection algorithm. We've spoken in the past about ring signatures and decoys in other previous episodes, and Sering specifically has talked about how the decoys are selected, but he used a very vague word, a vague phrase at least called randomly selected, right? And in this episode, we're going to get far more nuanced, far more specific about what we mean by this, this mysterious phrase. And also the phrase itself isn't very accurate either. So it's important to add some additional clarification here on what's actually happening. Um, and there's a lot more to random than behind the scenes. So I'm going to start with a screen share showing an example of some of Monero's input selection algorithms over the past. So on the top here, you can see an example of a completely random distribution algorithm. So on the left, you have old outputs that were generated at the very, very beginning of Monero's history. On the right, you have new outputs that are generated very, very re recently, especially within the past few days or so. Let's say that the green circle is the actual output that was spent. This is the real money that's sent, and the blue ones are the decoys that are selected. Now, a completely random distribution method might sound great to begin with because you know, any input could be selected for any reason, but this leads to a lot of unintended like consequences as a result. So you can make pretty strong heuristics that say people are far more likely to spend new money than old money. So as a result, the latest input, the, the green one highlighted here, is most likely to be the real one. And while you don't necessarily have the ground truth to prove that this is true, it could be tested as, as very reliable over time. You could make a potentially very strong heuristic there. And you can see in the example on the screen on the first, on the first line there, that is the case because th that's often the case, right? Um, so Monero sought to improve upon this, iterate upon this. And you can see on the second line there, there's an example of a recent zone selection algorithm. So you have, again, the whole history of Monero's outputs, but you have a short recent zone period where you're more likely to select other decoys from the specific period. So Monero's code might specify, for instance, that the recent zone needs to be about 1.8 days and that you should select about half of the decoys from this said recent zone. So you can see on this example here that about half the decoys are selected from this recent zone. And then for the rest of the tail going back to previous time, like the very beginning of Monero's history, you still have the ability to select these outputs but they're less common than new outputs. And this helps address the specific heuristic we're speaking about where the, the latest output is the most, the, the latest output in the ring is usually the true one because now you have more latest, out, latest decoys included in this ring. So therefore you have uh, more plausible selected outputs in this case. And the recent zone was nice and simple. It was a really easy way to implement this sort of feature. And it would definitely was an improvement over the existing uh, completely random system Monero began with, but it's not ideal. And so Monero has moved to what more resembles the bottom line there, which is uh, a matching distribution, one that is based on empirically observed uh, distributions based off what we've uh, Monero and outside researchers, researchers found with Bitcoin and Monero. It's a mathematical model. So you can see that in this case, the newest outputs are even more likely to be selected, for instance. So uh, this, I, hopefully this diagram helps show how it's not just about how many inputs there are in a transaction, it's also about how you select them. And there's a lot of implications on how these are actually selected. But it's more than just timing, as I show here. Timing is just one part of how this is done. And for the, to this end, Serang is going to speak a little bit more specifically about other factors involved in the selection algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's worth noting that, you know, technically the way that we still do it and the way that we've always done it did have elements of randomness to it. I mean, random is kind of a, it's a, it's often a really poor word, right? So for example, even though typically the outputs that you'll choose kind of follow that particular mathematical model, there is an element of randomness involved. So, you know, two people can definitely choose very, very different rings, but you know, on average, they'll follow a pattern that looks approximately like the pattern that you've showed. So there's always still randomness into it. Um, but like you said, Timing heuristics or, you know, guesses that an adversary might, ba might make based just on the age of the output, like you said, are only one heuristic. They're a pretty big heuristic, right? Because, you know, in general, 
um, for a lot of old transactions, you could guess what you thought the newest one was, and and you know you might be right, although you couldn't prove it, you know, implicitly. Um, but timing is just one part, um, and we've iterated since then to kind of mitigate against other smaller heuristics that were not timing based. Um, so one example deals with something called Coinbase outputs. And if you're not familiar with the term, um, basically every Monero block of transactions that is generated has a special output in it that generates new money as part of the protocol. That's kind of what helps to reward miners for doing work in part. And those Coinbase outputs I like to think of as you know newly generated money. So in general, do people spend newly generated money or Coinbase outputs as the true spender? You know, probably not necessarily as often as non-new money or non-Coinbase outputs. So for example, if I happen to choose a ring that contained, I don't know, 10 Coinbase outputs, and then my true output, which was not a Coinbase output, an adversary might look at that and think, hmm, I would say it's much more likely that this person you know, didn't spend a Coinbase output because that's all very new money. So that could be a heuristic that they might use. They might think Coinbase outputs are probably decoys. Well, in that case, that would kind of imply that we should select fewer Coinbase outputs as part of our rings. How many is too many or too few? I mean, that's not a very well-defined problem with a very well-defined solution. But as we've iterated our selection algorithm to make it better against this you know, guess newest heuristic involving output age, you know, we probably introduced more Coinbase outputs than some people would have liked. So we made a slight modification to the algorithm where instead of just choosing a block and then yanking a decoy out of it, which tends to give us more Coinbase outputs than fewer, instead we actually look at a very small window around that particular block. So we're effectively increasing the size of the bin from which we get to choose our outputs. And what that ends up meaning statistically is that we end up choosing fewer Coinbase outputs, which kind of mitigates against this much smaller heuristic. And that, of course, is not the only heuristic type you might come up with either. So Coinbase outputs are one thing an adversary might use to look at to try to make guesses. Timing, which we've worked on, of course, and have talked about, might be one that an adversary might use. Um, there's other ones. For example, if I have a transaction that has two different inputs, each of those has a separate ring, maybe the adversary is able to look at the different uh, decoys and uh, outputs that are in those rings, and maybe the adversary will find that there's a uh, transaction way back when in the blockchain that generated two different outputs. And maybe one of those outputs appears in one of the inputs to my new transaction, and the other output appears as an input to the other one. Again, it's just a guess because it may have happened by chance, but probably not. The adversary might try to conclude that the outputs that were generated in a previous transaction are now being spent by me and might make some conclusions based on that. Again, without external information, a heuristic is not a proof, but it gives the adversary something that they might try to guess. So in general, this is very, very complex. I will say right now, it is pretty impossible to get rid of all possible heuristics. So we can always make our selection algorithms better. And as Justin pointed out, and as I've kind of hinted at, we have done this over time. We iterate to get better and better. A good way to think about this is something that Justin brought up, in fact, kind of with like a, a plugging of a hole analogy, if you want to give that, which I kind of liked. Yeah, of course. So um, one example, like we, we, we know of a specific heuristic, for instance. The, the guess newest heuristic might be an example. So we can iterate Monero's selection algorithm to help counter this sort of heuristic and the actual effectiveness of it. But in doing so, we're still choosing some other way to select outputs that people can develop heuristics for. So there's no limits to the number of heuristics that people can come up with. They can continue making complicated heuristics over time, pretty much no matter what we do. So we're always plugging these holes that we're aware of and the biggest holes we know of, but we might indirectly be making smaller holes. We might be making holes that we're not necessarily aware of because maybe the heuristics haven't been conceived yet, especially by participants in the Monero community. So this is definitely something that will need continuous improvement. It needs continuous iteration in order to make it better, to keep patching these holes. You can't just pave a road and never expect it to have potholes. You have to suffer through like the Minnesotan winters like I have, where you go and you have to keep patching these potholes that keep appearing, right? They, they keep coming out. And when you think you're done, some truck's gonna drive over it and come up with and make a new one, right? So. <laughs> these, these sort of circumstances keep happening. Apologies for that terrible analogy. Um, I'm trying to play serang here. Um, but yeah, we try to address the big ones first, the example of the, the, the guest new Q is, uh, but there might have been some consequences. As an example, by changing the selection algorithm to follow a more mathematical distribution, we actually selected more of those Coinbase outputs and we needed to go back and sort of refine how we did this. Was every improve, was every iteration still an improvement overall? 
from what we can see now, it should be. Yes, we, we've addressed the existing heuristics and, and done more good than harm, but there's always going to be some sort of trade-off that we're going to sort of keep playing with, uh, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we definitely receive reports all the time about people who come up with, you know, a particular small pattern that they might see among certain transactions or outputs based on the way that we make our selections. Um, and some of those are very, very small. Um, doesn't mean that, you know, it's optimal that we keep them in there. Um, but, you know, to some extent, um, it's not necessarily always obvious how to make um, an absolute good change to counter some of those small heuristics without inadvertently kind of ruining the work that we've done for some of the much bigger heuristics. So. You know, if we see a small heuristic pointed out and we don't change our algorithm because of it, you know, it doesn't mean that we are not concerned about those heuristics, um, but it means that we always have to balance the good that we'd be doing by making such a change with the inadvertent harm that might be caused by it. So it's, it's always an arms race, right? Financial privacy as a whole, as you're probably learning from this video series, is an arms race. Analysis only gets better over time, and that's great. You know, just because we receive small reports sometimes and big reports other times about different heuristics that come up doesn't mean we don't want to see them. I love seeing those reports. I love learning more about what other people are doing with this analysis. Um, but it just reminds me that it is an arms race. Analysis gets, gets better. We get better because of that. You know, that might invite more analysis, which just has kind of this spiraling effect toward us getting better. Yeah, speak, speaking about spiraling effects towards getting better, one of the great things about ring signatures is that the selection algorithm and the ring size sort of go hand in hand in sort of a positive or negative feedback loop, if you may. I suppose if you're purposely making things worse. But as Monero increases its ring size, it sort of decreases the severe negativeness of, of perhaps a, a bad selection algorithm or some limitations of a selection algorithm. If you just keep picking more and more inputs, for example, right, more and more decoys, the you know shortcomings of a specific algorithm might decrease well, or should ideally decrease meanwhile if you improve your selection algorithm you make better use of the decoys that you have so these two components are really critically important in having strong privacy in monero making the most out of its ring signatures because if you have a large ring size with a terrible selection algorithm then you're not gonna have great privacy because you're able to develop really strong heuristics potentially. And likewise, if you have a really, even if you had a, some mechanism of having a perfect algorithm under every circumstance, but you had a like really small ring size, for example, then you're also not great either. So these things really critically work hand in hand at providing really the privacy that ring signatures offer. It's more than just what they say they provide out of the box, which is one out of, in Monero's case, is case now 10, 11, one out of 11 are possibly spent. It's all the additional metadata, timing analysis, Coinbase metadata that is associated with this. And so the selection algorithm needs to adjust over time to, to compensate for this. Otherwise, we could just pick the first 10 outputs that were ever generated on Monero's blockchain and be like, oh, it's either the latest or the first 10. And that's obviously not very convincing. So, you know, <laughs> it's input selection algorithm is very important for Monero's ring signatures. All right, Sarang, do you have any last closing thoughts to leave uh, the, the viewer with? Um, just that our goal still remains to provide the best plausible deniability possible with ring signatures. And over time, we continue to learn about better and better ways to do that. And so we keep iterating and iterating and iterating to get better. And we're absolutely not perfect now, um, but we continue to try to get better and better. All right, thank you, Sarang. Thank you everyone for watching this episode of Breaking Monero. We will catch you in the next one. Take care.